our next speaker, Nathan Chung. Uh, talk is on neurodiversity in cybersecurity. Nathan Chung is a cloud security researcher specialist with more than 20 years of experience in IT and cybersecurity, an advocate for women in cyber and neurodiversity. He serves on multiple boards, including WICYS, Women in Cybersecurity Colorado, Ignite Worldwide, and Spark Mindset. In addition, he volunteers on more than 12 committees and groups. He's also the host of the NeuroSec podcast. Excellent. So I am looking forward to this one, and it is my responsibility, for better or for worse, to click the play button. Any uh, last commentary before we fade away and let this video take its place, Wesley? No, let it, let it rip. All right, the, let the games begin. Welcome to GrimCon 03. My name is Nathan Chung. Today I will be talking about neurodiversity in cybersecurity. In 1997, Apple released a famous ad that went like this. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pigs and square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Steve Jobs and Apple were right. In fact, history is filled with many incredible people who are openly neurodiverse or are suspected or reported to have neurodiverse traits. Among them, Susan Boyle, Albert Einstein, Mozart, Jerry Seinfeld, Alan Turing, Richard Branson, Nikola Tesla, Emily Dickinson, Bill Gates, Jessica Jane Applegate, and many, many more. For myself, I am actually autistic and I have ADHD. I remember my first meltdown. I was talking to a woman who got annoyed that I didn't maintain eye contact and was constantly distracted. From that day on, I came to realize that I have suffered from both conditions throughout my long career in IT and cybersecurity spanning more than 20 years. But I didn't know what it meant to be neurodiverse until the past few years. I am host of the Neurosic podcast and co-founder of WESIS, Women in Cybersecurity Colorado. I'm a member of the WESIS Neurodiversity Group, and I also serve on three nonprofit boards, including Ignite Worldwide, Wesis Colorado, and Spark Mindset. Today, I will briefly cover neurodiversity and will then discuss how neurodiverse people can help reduce the cybersecurity skills gap, go over the ideal cybersecurity jobs, roadblocks, and changes that need to be made. First, what are neurodiverse conditions and neurodiversity? Neurodiverse conditions include not just autism and ADHD, but also dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and many more. Autism itself is a spectrum, so people can vary greatly in terms of functionality and capability. Neurodiversity is the idea that these neurological differences are natural variations in human genomes, which reminds me of the X-Men cartoons that I watched growing up. Similar to the X-Men, despite the many famous people in history who were and are neurodiverse, there is a negative stigma today and society often labels neurodiverse individuals as freaks, geeks, loners, and misfits. This is often due to the fear of differences in people, especially in people that do not look or act like us. People who are neurodiverse often have poor social skills, reduced executive functions, anxiety, meltdowns, and sensory overload. 
This gives the perception that neurodiverse people are broken. As a result, they often wear masks and pretend to be just like everyone else to fit in. Similar to software virtualization, pretending to be normal is exhausting. Sadly, they are not free to be themselves and they have a harder, harder time living and thriving in today's world. On the flip side, this highlights an unspoken truth that neurodiverse conditions are invisible and you cannot easily identify a neurodiverse person even though many work in technology and cybersecurity. This is a tragedy because many neurodiverse people have skills and capabilities that make them ideal to work in cybersecurity, which currently has a severe shortage of workers. Being able to hyperfocus is great for reverse engineering malware. Performing repetitive tasks is great for parsing through security logs. Being process oriented helps when responding to incidents where a failure to follow incident response processes and procedures such as chain of custody can make the difference between a successful prosecution of a suspect or letting them go free. The ability to find a needle in the haystack is great for hunting security threats in a network. Out of the box thinking is great for writing scripts, which is a key cyber skill today for automation. Being highly creative helps when attacking networks. Inversely, having a strong attention to detail is great for defending networks against attacks. Their specialized abilities make neurodiverse people great candidates for many technical cybersecurity jobs, such as threat hunter, forensics analyst, incident response, malware engineer, pen tester, and many more. Inversely, non-technical jobs are tend to be less ideal, such as security project manager, privacy officer, security auditor, or compliance and risk manager. Cybersecurity jobs have already been proven to be a great fit for neurodiverse people. For example, Unit 9900 of Israel's Defense Forces hires many dozens of people who are on autism spectrum due to their visual thinking and detailed analytical capabilities. This is also a potential national security issue. Similar to Israel, other countries around the world are finding and poaching top cybersecurity talent. If US companies do not hire neurodiverse workers for cybersecurity jobs, our enemies and friends will. Neurodiversity can also be the key to recruit more women into cybersecurity. Many women today have neurodiverse conditions, such as autism and ADHD, but they often go undiagnosed. This is also a tragedy since women with such conditions are not aware that cybersecurity is not for men only. I myself know a great many women working in cybersecurity throughout the world who are just as good as men, if not better. In the sign of progress compared to when I was growing up, neurodiverse conditions can now be identified in girls at a younger age. Instead of feeling confused and negatively labeled, imagine if people show them how special and amazing they are. Also, that a career in cybersecurity is a possible career field for them. I, myself, advocate for that girls and young women need to be supported because they will become the future cybersecurity workers and leaders of tomorrow. Now the roadblocks. First, despite the many advantages that neurodiverse workers can bring to cybersecurity, roadblocks exist that can be best described as trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. At many companies, having a disability is still seen as a problem because they evaluate workers 
based on output similar to a factory where every worker is expected to be productive and problem free. When a neurodiverse person requests accommodations, people and companies see the increased costs and changes as burdens. I have heard too many stories where companies prefer to terminate or eliminate neurodiverse workers. Corporate culture needs to change. Second, typical career paths in cybersecurity are not optimized to meet the needs of neurodiverse workers. Typically, workers often start at entry level, progress to mid-level, get promoted to manager, and then go on into executive management. Problem that, problem, what if a person does not want to be a manager? Social interactions are where many neurodiverse people struggle. Also with, also many neurodiverse workers will prefer to stay in a technical position. The typical career path have and will continue to fail them. To make matters worse, changing job descriptions and career paths are often very hard to do, especially with older legacy HR systems that are often difficult to reconfigure. Since many companies retain such legacy HR systems due to the high cost of replacing them, change is almost impossible. In my experience, companies will often choose not to change settings in legacy systems and just hope that the system doesn't break. Even more difficult are job descriptions and career paths for government positions. When I started my first full-time IT position working at Honolulu Police Department in Hawaii, they still use ancient technology terms in their job descriptions, such as microcomputer. The term microcomputer was popular back in the 1970s and 80s. Unfortunately, many years later, not much has changed. This is part of a job description or a government position today. Why are these ancient terms still used? Often because in federal, state, and local governments, changing job descriptions and career paths would typically require legislative changes. One example I remember was how one city government handled a broken HP LaserJet 2 printer. Legislation provided extensive funding for printer repair and less funding for printer replacement. So instead of spending less money to replace the printer, they are forced to repair it. Add to that, if a state is heavily unionized, it is even harder to pass legislation to make these changes. In a job early in my career, I was part of a team that attempted to negotiate with the unions to make changes to labor laws so that a technical person could advance their, in their career, stay technical, and not become a manager. The unions would not budge. Worse yet, promotions are oftentimes harder for people who are neurodiverse. I remember an episode from an Apple TV series for all mankind, where a boss explained, you are not what is called a team player. You have many strengths, intelligence, intuition, cunning, determination. Nonetheless, now you have seniority, experience, impeccable credentials. So why were you passed over for promotion? It is because you do not play the game. You resist forming the social bonds necessary to be seen as a team member. Therefore, you are not and will never will be seen as a team leader. This one dialogue shows how important it is to be social in order to advance. This is perhaps one of the biggest roadblocks. Consider who would be most favorable for promotion. Mr. X who is neurodiverse, he generates tons of productivity and often struggles 
at social events such as happy hours. Or Mr. Y, who is not neurodiverse, he is the life of the party at happy hours and has tons of friends in the office. In my experience, Mr. Y will always win out, especially for promotion into management roles. This is because he can develop the social relationships to build trust and navigate office politics. In my long history working in IT and cybersecurity, workplaces will often systematically, unconsciously, and naturally promote in this manner. I myself experienced this. Drinking at happy hours is one of the most common group activities, along with golf and sports events. When a person refuses to attend, as many who are neurodiverse may often choose, it sends the message that you are not a team player, you are antisocial, and definitely not worthy of promotion. This effectively and unfairly shuts out many neurodiverse people for promotion into higher level positions. So what can be done to remove these roadblocks? First, let's start with interviews. Some companies interview with a panel with large number of interviewers. For some neurodiverse interviewees, this can be very intimidating. One solution, limit the number of interviewers to just one person. In addition, the traditional interview is a social ritual with lots of questions. So a neurodiverse interviewee will struggle. Instead, allow them to show and demonstrate the skills required for the position. One example is whiteboarding to show how the interviewee would solve a problem. In short, give them the opportunity to shine. Second, corporate cultures need to change. A person who is neurodiverse should not be labeled as being broken or disabled. Strengths and abilities should be identified just like everyone else. Tool should be right, tools should be provided as needed. Managers need to be trained to manage neurodiverse workers with patience and empathy and not rely on typical social styles and management methods that hinder neurodiverse workers. Third, career paths for cybersecurity workers need to change. Career paths need to be changed to allow workers to stay in technical roles but still advance. Eliminate the bias of staying in a technical, te in a technical position. Eliminate requirements that force workers into positions where they cannot thrive. Do the hard work to make the changes. Upgrade HR systems and, pa and if necessary, pass applicable legis legislation or policies. Essentially, get it done. Finally, workplaces need to go all in. There are many companies that have neurodiversity hiring programs. The flaw is that the changes made affect only a small part of the organization without creating necessarily, without creating necessarily making lasting changes to affect the whole. Companies need to go all in so that the, change, so that the changes have real impact to ultimately respect the differences, strengths, and weaknesses of not just neurodiverse workers, but all people. Thank you. Here is my contact information. Also, please feel free to listen to my podcast, Neurosec, where I flip script and interview amazing people in cybersecurity who are neurodiverse. And thank you for, to NeuroCon for this wonderful opportunity to speak at GrimCon. That sigh at the end just said it all. I know he was glad to get that done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
I have felt those those sighs at the end of talks. Absolutely. Normally, I wait until I turn on video, but I record it right now. No, it, it's totally <laughs> normal. I mean, that's part of it. It's totally normal. It's like, whew. yeah. Uh, right. Now, where is that turn off the recording button? Okay. <laughs> oh boy, now that it's stopped recording, I can. Oh wait, I'm still being recorded. No, yeah, I've done all those things. <laughs> All no, right. This was awesome. I, I loved it. I love this yeah, talk. That was, that was a great it's, talk. It, it, different perspectives help us all. Different, right? If you think of neurodiverse as being kind of the edge of a bell curve, right? Uh, here. Impromptu bell curve. Come on. Yeah, it, it is, it's great that this is at least being brought up in a topic and everything. This this is awesome because this I feel like this is something needs to be more talked about um, with like HR um, as well as management. He mentioned that you know management and finding great talent and everything, um, mm -hmm. finding like who are those like top performers. You know they not all, they don't always score high on tests and everything like that, or may not score high on uh, uh, just. The things that you think they are, but they're very high performing in certain areas. And you know, that's pretty much most of cybersecurity. You know, some people are very high performing in very certain areas, you know. Um so you know bell curve, right? Distribution across a here's normal in the exact middle, but nobody's exactly one hundred percent to that exact line, they are normal. And plus there's not just one dimension of existence. So across each bell curve, if you will, of attributes. You're going to be somewhere fairly randomly along that line and or along that curve i should say and on average you're going to have a lot of things that you're closer to the center of the bell curve but not everything pretty much by definition if you roll enough dice you're not going to get threes and fours all the time you're going to get some ones and sixes or if you uh, roll enough stats and dungeons and dragons you're not always going to be you know uh 10 11 12. sometimes you're going to have some threes sometimes you're going to have some 18s you're going to be further along the bell curve. That is inevitable. That is not wrong by any means. It is just a state of reality. And to try to exclude people because they don't happen to be in the center of the bell curve along some axis that you happen to care about, you're excluding so many people with uh, such such great useful insights for you that, that saddens me <laughs> to think of. Uh, so just wanted to speak to that, but, and that whole talk was amazing. I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, that uh, Nathan was able to join for, for GrimCon to share that with us.